Good evening, and welcome to Town Hall. Please, take this moment to silence and store all electronic devices. The Town Hall proudly presents Laurie Anderson. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Great. Thank you. You know, it's really uh, great to be here. Thanks so much, and welcome to Town Hall. This is our book party for All the Things I Lost in the Flood, which just came out last week, subtitled Essays on Pictures, Language, and Code. It's a book about language and politics and identity and narrators and prison. And it's about time and animals and failure, but most of all, it's about stories, what they are and who gets to tell them and, and how. And it's about our own stories and other people's stories. And it's about how to start stories and what happens when you tell them too often and what happens when they end. And tonight, because we're in town hall, because of the uh, era we're in as well, I'm going to focus on some of the more political stories. So, um, yeah. <laughs> now, there are hundreds uh, of pictures in, um, in here, the, uh, in this book. I'll just flip through a few of them. Um, <laughs> to give you a quick look at how it's sort of organized and the, the content for these... Um, Essays are just really lots of different projects in the book, which I've worked on for the last like 40 years. And there's sculpture and writing and music and film and painting and opera and various like, inventions and theories. And tonight I'll mention some of them and I'll also tell you uh, a lot about a, a couple of, of the other ones. That's enough. That's okay. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm what's known as like a multimedia artist, which is a completely meaningless term at this point when basically everyone in the world is doing multimedia non-stop, but I found that it's a kind of useful idea because otherwise things get chopped up into very small categories with lots of rules for each category, like what a novel is supposed to be and what a film is supposed to look like. And in fact, the world is a lot weirder and looser than that. For example, I, I really like what the composer John Adams said about John Cage's work for 33, and this is a piece course, in which the musician sits in front of the piano for exactly four minutes and 33 seconds and without playing and then just gets up and leaves. And Adam said, you know, it wasn't really very interesting music, but it was really good philosophy. <laughs> so this book is also about how things change from one thing to another as they're made, and it's about failures and false starts and lots and lots of, like, plan Bs. But, you know, for some reason, lately I've been thinking back to about a year and a half ago, waking up in the morning after the election, and it was such a dull, gray November day, and the, all the streets of New York were all empty, and it was really quiet, and most of the people in them could barely drag themselves out of the house, or even really out of bed. I remember that really well. So reality, it just started to be something that we just didn't really recognize anymore. And I'm thinking, why isn't anyone saying anything? And the next thing I hear is this, like, blood-curdling scream. And Yoko Ono had posted her reaction to the election, <laughs> and she had screamed for one minute. And this was not an avant-garde art scream with all sorts of metaphorical or art historical hidden meanings. It was a straight-up, no-holds-barred, bloody murder, death scream from hell. <laughs> now, for the last year, I have to say that it's Yoko's scream that I hear almost every morning. <laughs> and every morning I think, thank God, someone is going really far out there. Anyway, it's uh, Yoko's 85th birthday this Sunday. And in honor of her birthday, I'm going to ask you to scream, not for a minute, but just for 10 seconds. And I want you to prepare for this by thinking about all the things in your life that are really screwed up right now. Or you can think about Korea and the climate and the upcoming military parade and our businessman president. And if you need to think about the stock market, go ahead. And, and uh, I'm going to 
time it. And I want you to give it all you've got. Just really don't hold back. Ready? So here we go. Excellent. Anyway, we're just going to play little bits of music here and now, uh, here and then. And I don't know about you, though, but I have um, tried lots of ways to cope with the Trump era. And one of the most successful ways that I've found, um, other than writing this book and taking every single project I can possibly get, um, has been TV. And I've never watched that much TV, and I, I've become totally addicted in the last year to one show, the British comedy Doc Martin. Anybody know that one? It's, it's, uh, I've watched all eight seasons now and about 20 times, which is a really massive amount of TV. <laughs> I know all the cuts and every, uh, all, all the lines, and every time I hear the theme song, it's just like, it's like crack. You know, I'm there. Uh, brief summary, Doc Martin is a very meticulous type A London surgeon who develops hemophobia, and so he has to quit and he goes to a small town in Cornwall where he doesn't fit in at all. And he wears this perfect Savile Row suit, and he's rude to everyone, and he kind of knows everything. And then you get to know all the locals, and they have really unusually a uh, wide variety of medical problems. And they come into the office, and they say, hey, doc, could you have a look at this? And they roll up their sleeves, and the camera zooms in for close-ups of these horrendous, like, bloody lesions and oozing boils. And the town of Port Wynn is by the sea, and it's so beautiful, and all the problems are so solvable. And so I just watched these shows over and over, and I've gotten to know everyone in them really well. And, but after a few months, it really started to bother me that I was so involved with these characters. And I talked to my Buddhist teacher, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really addicted to this show, and I, I just can't stop watching it. I mean, I watch it every single night. And he said, well, how does that make you feel? And I said, good, good, it makes me feel good. <laughs> But, but listen, here's the problem. I just watch it over and over all the time, and I'm really worried because my best friends are actors on television. And he said, um, well, how well do you know your uh, real friends? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm still looking around at them and thinking about that. Anyway. Uh, the book starts off on... October, in October 2012, with Hurricane Sandy. And I live next to the Hudson, and when Sandy hit the city, the Hudson River overflowed its banks and it crossed the street, and it poured into our building. And we had to evacuate, but almost immediately, the water filled the huge basement of my studio, which was full of the physical archive of my work, and paintings and sculptures from the 70s, and all sorts of keyboards and instruments and 3D projectors and props and 
dozens of projectors and, and uh, electronics and records and dozens and dozens of boxes. Anyway, as soon as I could get back into the building, I went down to the basement to see what I could fish out and maybe dry out and save. Now, the Hudson is technically an estuary, so uh, there's a lot of salt in the water and seawater completely destroys things. It just pulverizes them. Metal, cardboard, fabric, electronics, the entire contents of the basement had just sort of dissolved into this gray, amorphous oatmeal pulp. And I, just, I couldn't believe it. Every last thing in the basement archive was gone. And I was, I was completely devastated. And then, it was only two days later when I thought, wow, you know, now I actually don't need to clean the basement. <laughs> and about two days after that, I was reading the list of things, the inventory, and I have to say that reading the names of the things was somehow just about as good, maybe even better, than having a basement full of things. I mean, it was weird. It was better to read the words than to have the things. Words let you picture things. Words are signposts, and after all, it all happens anyway in your mind. So this book starts out with stories about how words, and on a larger scale, stories, can substitute for things that are gone. For example, the word yellow is a memorial for the color yellow. And it's about what happens as we begin to live in a world that's more and more abstract, when language, uh, abstraction, and codes start to be the new real things. And along the way, it's about the death grip that we have on our phones since so many things have disappeared into them and become uh, representations. But one of the difficult things about stories is how to start them. I mean, it's so hard to stare at the blank page or the, or the blank white screen while that cursor just keeps blinking and blinking and blinking. So every second waiting for the first word. So I made a program to cure writer's block. So it was, uh, it was part of a CD-ROM called uh, Puppet Motel uh, from the 90s. And um, the first thing this program gives you is a lot of suggestions for the title of your novel. And then instead of starting with a blank page, it starts with a kind of complete uh, digital version of the novel Crime and Punishment. <laughs> and it uses substitution instead of invention. So you can quickly substitute your friends' names for the Russian characters, your own locations for the Russian places, and your own problems and situations for Dostoevsky's. And pretty soon, you have your own very long and pretty complicated uh, novel, and no one will be able to tell that it's actually based on Dostoevsky's book. <laughs> but here's the ironic thing, uh, is that um, the playback technology for CD-ROMs has completely disappeared. And so Puppet Motel is unplayable on anything. It no longer exists. Uh, the whole thing, all the images, sounds, music, stories, became a confusing collection of files and directives and codes and lots of arrows just pointing <laughs> nowhere. Now sometimes, just getting started is the hardest part of the whole project. And there's so many hesitations and false starts. For example, take individual words. I mean, no one stutters at the end of a word. People only st stutter at the, b the beginning of the words because by the end of the word, it's, it's too late to be nervous. <laughs> no one ever stutters at the ending of the, of the words. You know, in the 80s, I did a show in Japan called Mr. Heartbreak, and for some reason, I decided to sing all the songs in Japanese. So I learned them phonetically, and I, it took a couple of months, but I, I was really pretty proud of myself. And, and then after the first concert, the Japanese promoter came backstage and he said, excuse me, pardon me, but you speak English really well. And I said, thank you, it's my native tongue. But excuse me, pardon me again, in, in Japanese, he said, you have a, quite a bad stutter. I couldn't believe it. I, I, later I discovered that the man who had made the cassette for me to copy had a really bad stutter. <laughs> and I'd copied everything perfectly. 
carefully noting that this particular word was Tsuru and this other one was Kukuru. Anyway, <laughs> it turned out to be impossible to learn the songs yet again because the stutter had just become part of the rhythm of the whole thing. <laughs> now, in addition to the difficulties with starting, there's the question of how to end them. And it's one of the reasons I, I never have intermissions in my shows, because if you have an intermission, then you have to have two beginnings and two endings. Um, but I have to say that um, one of my motivations for making this book has been the 2016 US elections and subsequent developments. And so for two years, we listened to all the presidential candidates tell their stories. And each candidate had a story about how the world is and how the world used to be and how things will be in the future. And you simply voted for the candidate whose story you liked the best. And then the stories got shorter and shorter until they were 10 word tweets and the news was fake or else it came from some mysterious place deep in the net, various combinations of rumor, gossip, and tweets from Russian trolls. Now, the, then the pace of the breaking news stories accelerated until there was a new story every couple of hours, and people began to just lose their balance, fall behind, and it was a crisis and a kind of emergency of stories. It was no longer a political situation. It was an existential one. Now, in order to want understand what was happening, people then began inventing their own weird stories. For some, it was a conspiracy or a coup. And for some, it was the inevitable last stage of capitalism or the swing of a pendulum that would eventually swing back. And for some, it was a surreal thriller with no plot starring the liars, misers, and psychopaths who were suddenly in charge. And for some people, it was the beginning of a revolution. And for some, the apocalypse and their stories were darkly specific fantasies about evil and violence and the coming nuclear holocaust and planetary extinction. And people are suddenly talking about how things end in their bestsellers like the doomsday machine and the sixth extinction. But nobody actually has any idea where their stories are going or how they might end. And they begin to speculate about what would happen if we're the first humans to see the end and how we would tell that story when we would be telling it to nobody. And is it still a story if you tell it to nobody? And finally, we realized that what was actually happening was we were drowning in our own stories. Now maybe the scariest part of life these days is that no one is in charge. And I've written a lot about captains and authority, and of course, one of the big questions now is who's in charge? And the answer is, no one is in charge. And it's not like the captain just went below deck to have a nap. It's more like the whole place has become one of those you know, remote controlled unmanned tankers that crisscross the Pacific and with no captain and no crew, just enormous loads of oil and gas and weapons moving um, on its own. Uh, this is also a book about books, and I love books, and one of the projects uh, that I've, uh, and a lot of the projects I've done uh, about books have books at the center of them, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or also uh, the Bible, and um, one of the reasons I decided to make an opera about Moby Dick was that Melville's book has, uh, was such an American story and because it was about a phantom captain. But let me say right now, this was a, a big mistake. And that if you're planning to do anything like that, you know, write an opera about your favorite book, just stop right now. <laughs> because if you really love that book, it's likely that you're gonna be just like too respectful. And you'll get, have the white gloves on, and, and with something like this, you really just have to be a lot rougher. Now, I made this, the same mistake a second time when I fell in love with Gravity's Rainbow. And this time, I wrote to Thomas Pynchon, and I said, I really love your book, and could you possibly allow me to make an opera based on it? And Pynchon is a f really famous recluse, so I, I didn't actually think... Uh, I would ever hear from him, but uh, I got a letter and he said, 
I love your music, and of course, I'd be happy if you made an opera based on my book. And I have only one condition, and that is that the entire opera be scored for solo banjo. <laughs> now, some people have the nicest way of saying, no, 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 not over my dead body will you make an opera based on my novel. Anyway, one of the things I really love about Moby Dick is the jump cuts. And you might remember it starts with Ishmael, who says, you know, I, I, you know what I'm thinking of doing? I, I'm thinking of going to sea. But if I go to sea, what would I do? And he says, well, I could be a captain. But no, no I hate bossing people around. And how about the first mate? Uh, no, I don't like taking orders. Hey, how about like a, a cook? I mean, I like roast chicken, and really, who doesn't like roast chicken? The Egyptians like roast chicken, and, and broiled ibis, and roasted river horse, and you can tell by the mummies of those creatures in their giant bakehouses, the pyramids. And okay, you're on page three. How did you get from Nantucket to ancient Egypt in one paragraph? And it just goes on like that from here. Now, one of the problems with working on this opera about Moby Dick was that I live in downtown New York, not that far from where Melville worked as a customs agent, and I thought he might basically come and find me and kill me. <laughs> you know, say something like, look, my book is fine the way it is. It just does not need to be a multimedia opera. Um, another great thing about the book is that from the very beginning, you're lost. It's a whaling ship, and it travels in a zigzag pattern, just looking for whales. It's not like a merchant ship that goes directly from port X to port Y in a straight line, delivering stuff back and forth, or an explorer ship that just keeps on sailing west until it eventually finds something. No, the whaler travels this way, then back that way, always looking, always heading off on tangents, sort of like the story itself. And so, I read the book again and again, and each time it was more mysterious and more and more like a story about thoughts, about the way the mind works. And I read and reread and made many plans to start, but it was so elusive, it just kept slipping away. When I finally started writing the opera, a friend said, I have a present for you. And he brought over a huge cardboard box, and inside it was Melville's Bible the Bible that he had had when he was writing Moby Dick, and it was full of handwritten notes in the margins, but the notes had been erased by his wife, and it should be said that their relationship wasn't exactly ideal, and she was pretty ticked that he had been writing in the family Bible, and you know, so she had just erased them all. Uh, my friend had bought the Bible at Sotheby's, and he took, the, he took it to the FBI, and he said, can you tell me what's been erased? And they said, well, maybe if it had been 100 years ago, or whatever, you know, but it was 150 and so on, so no. <laughs> so I went through the Bible with a magnifying glass, looking for anything that said whale or leviathan, and I found a passage in Isaiah 27.1 that was circled several times and had a lot of stars out in the margin. And the Lord shall smote leviathan, that crooked serpent, that piercing serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And I thought, wow, wait a second, here it is in writing, in print, the whale is the snake, and the ocean is his garden, where he works out ideas of good and evil. I was completely, completely hair-raising. Now, some of you uh, may not know that the first version of Moby Dick most likely didn't have Captain Ahab. And I really like picturing Melville meeting with his editor, and the editor, you know, would say something like, you know, Herman, the, the book is really interesting, and lo lots of really good information about, you know, whales and sea life, and all those passages about rope making and harpoons, good, good stuff, good stuff, <laughs> super interesting. But, you know, in the end, let's face it, it it's basically, you know, guys go fishing. I mean... Where is this going? I mean, you need, you, need, you, you need an engine. You need, I don't know, how about like a crazy captain? <laughs> so the next version, he puts Ahab in, but he doesn't appear until about a third of the way into the book because he's supposedly hiding in his cabin for the first part of the voyage. But of course, the real reason he wasn't there was because he hadn't been written yet. 
And when he does appear, he's like an actor from a play, and he comes storming out of the moldy hold, speaking old English with a British accent. Uh, Avast! Has seen the white whale, and he doesn't seem to know that much about sailing. But <laughs> suddenly, everything is really melodramatic, and, and he's stalking around the deck, yelling and muttering about fate and evil, and none of the Yankee sailors can figure out what he's talking about. Um, and so there it was, Ahab had become this kind of raging American Lear who had memorized the Bible, and he was obsessed with the fact that all of the evil in the world was embodied in the whale he was desperately hunting. And of course, his story was that the, in the end, what he looked for and what he finally found ate him alive. Last year, I was on a twin-engine plane from Milwaukee to New York City, and just over LaGuardia, one of the engines conked out, and we started to drop straight down, flipping over and over. Then, the other engine died, and we went completely out of control. New York City started to get taller and taller. A voice came over the intercom and said, Our pilot has informed us that we are about to attempt a crash landing. Please extinguish all cigarettes. Place your tray tables in their upright, locked position. Your captain says, please do not panic. Your captain says, place your head in your hands. Your captain says, put your hands on your knees. Captain says, put your hands on your head. Put your hands on your knees. <laughs> this is your captain. Have you lost your dog? We are going down. We are all going down. Together. As it turned out, we were caught in a downdraft and rammed into a bank. It was, in short, a miracle. But afterwards, I was terrified of getting onto planes. The moment I started walking down that aisle, my eyes would clamp shut, and I would fall into a deep, impenetrable sleep. You don't want to see this. You don't want to be here. Have you lost your dog? Finally, I was able to remain conscious, but I always had to go up into the forward cabin and ask one of the stewardesses if I could sit next to them. Hi! Uh, mind if I join you? And they were always rather irritated. Oh, all right, what a baby. And I watched their uniforms crack as we made nervous chit-chat. Now sometimes, even this didn't work, and I had to find one of the other passengers to talk to. Now you can spot these people immediately. There's one on every flight. Someone who's really on your wavelength. I was on a flight from L.A. when I spotted one of them sitting across the aisle. A girl, about 15, and she had this stuffed rabbit set up on her tray table, and she kept arranging and rearranging the rabbit and kind of waving to it. Hi. Hi there. And I decided, this is the one I want to sit next to. 
So I sat down and we started to talk and suddenly I realized she was speaking an entirely different language. Computerese. A kind of a high-tech lingo. Everything was circuitry, electronics, switching. If she didn't understand something, it just didn't scan. We talked mostly about her boyfriend. And this guy was never in a bad mood. He was in a bad mode. Moody kind of a guy. And the romance was apparently kind of rocky. And she kept saying, man, oh man, you know, like, oh man, it's so digital. And she just meant the relationship was on again, off again. Always two things switching. Current runs through bodies. And then it doesn't. It was a language of sounds, of noise, of switching of signals. It was the language of the rabbit, the caribou, the penguin, the beaver, the language of the past. Current runs through bodies, and then it doesn't on again. Off again, always two things switching. One thing instantly replaces another. It was the language of the future. Put your knees up to your chins. Have you lost your dog? Put your hands over your eyes. Jump out of the plane. There is no pilot. You are not. This is the language of the on-again, off-again, future, and it is digital. Thank you. I've done a lot of stories about crazy captains and control, and, and one of my cousins is married to um, Bill Shatner, Captain Kirk. Uh, a couple of years ago, he, uh, he was doing a one-man show on Broadway here, and it was a kind of like a memoir show about his work, and he said, you know, people think I know a lot about outer space, and they, they're always asking me questions, and I keep saying, you don't understand, I'm an actor. And, but I said, but you're so good at playing captains and being in control and, you know, and some people think it's kind of real. And, you know, I, I have a lot of, I've written a lot of stories about captains in my work too. And, and he said, oh, really? Uh, well, well, we should really collaborate and like do a show together. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that, that would be great. You know, you should, you should come to one of, one of my shows. And, and then he, he did uh, come to one of my shows and he never brought up the collaboration uh, <laughs> after that. <laughs> now, as an artist, I've, I've worked with a lot of electronic voices and technology, and lately this creation of imaginary electronic characters has become a kind of global nightmare. There are millions of bots and trolls now, and they have names and personalities and backstories, and they're acting like people. I mean, really mean, unhinged people, and they're posting nonstop from their accounts, which are very difficult to track. And just as humans sink more and more into their devices and digital machines and move away from the real world, trolls and bots are becoming more involved in life, and they rant about things. They try to befriend humans, and some of them appear to be attempting to organize rallies and demonstrations in the so-called real world. Now, where did they come from? 
And who are these people made of words? Now, of course, one theory is they're being manufactured by Russians, and it does seem like Russians might be really good at writing this stuff. And you have to admit it must be so much fun for them over in the troll farms, you know, making Americans say really foul and totally insane things. And some of the trolls are, are sort of ridiculous cartoons, but others are becoming more like characters from Russian novels, you know, kill the killers and liars and halfwits in books like Crime and Punishment and The Idiot. But now, if you really listen, there's still something a bit off about them. And I said, it's just not quite right. Now, one of the reasons I started using these um, uh, digital voices back in the 70s was I was getting really sick of my own voice. And I just liked the idea of talking machines. And one of the first talking machines I made was an electronic parrot. And I made them because I realized that the shuffle modes in electronic word programs quickly became a, like a wild new language, like, like songwriting, only more intuitive and, and rambling and, and sort of strange. So uh, this parrot was on a perch, and he talked uh, nonstop, and he had a huge vocabulary. And uh, you can't uh, tell from the stills, but his... Um, Let's see, his, uh, where is it, it's going to be there. His, um, his beak was moving, uh, but it, it makes no sense because parrots are, are ventriloquists. They talk without moving their lips because the parrots don't her voice have lips. Her voice was like an old rusty pump that sent the words very, very slowly up a long pipe. And then when they got to her open mouth, the words came out like rusty wire wire that had been in the cold clay for a long time. I've been seeing dragons again. Yes, it's true. I don't like giving a nude woman a dollar. It's just my policy. So shoot me. That's just the way I see it. Maybe the batteries are running low. Here, let me take this pencil out of my mouth. Let's throw another lock on the fire and get down. Um, um. Another parrot was first shown uh, at the Guggenheim Museum Soho, and I'd been nominated for the Hugo Boss Prize, and they called and they said, you've been nominated for a prize, and you get to do a big exhibition. And I thought, wait a second, I, I don't really actually want to do a big exhibition right now. And they, they said, and it will be a competition with five other artists, and you'll, you'll have a group so show, and then some judges will decide on the winner. This sounded completely terrible. I mean, I, I hate competition, but in the, in the end, I finally did do the show. And I wrote some things for the parrot to say about competition and about how art should be judged. So um, here he is on that subject. Welcome to the Guggenheim Museum, Soho. The director's name is Tom Kranz. Now, I haven't actually met Tom. I can't really say that I know Tom personally. I mean, I don't have his home phone number. But I do know that this art contest was his idea. By the way, the winner of this contest will get $50,000, courtesy of the people at Hugo Boss. And by the way, I love their suits. You should probably stop by their showroom sometime. They are really, really excellent suits. Very nice fabrics. Very nice colors. They're suits for people with excellent taste. Anyway, the winner gets the money, but what do the losers get? My friend Robert said I should get five sets of steak knives. And when the big winner of this art contest is announced, I can give the sets of knives to all the losers. That way if I lose, I can at least get a nice set of steak knives. I think that's a pretty good idea, but I'm not sure I'll have the time to get them monogrammed. Competition. I love it. It's very, very, very American. I like to know what is best, and what is not as good. Sometimes, artwork is judged by using words. Here's how it works. This picture is worth 1,500 words. 
This one is worth three words. That picture over there is worth a paragraph. This picture is priceless. Impossible to say enough about it. That one over there is worthless. It's not even worth one single letter. Damn. Damn. Anyway, the, uh, uh, the parrot, he sits on a perch surrounded by paintings of words, and there's a sensor in his chest that tells him when people are in range. And he also uh, turns his head and, and looks at you, and um, here's the, uh, the mechanism inside of a lot, lot of different motors. And um, also, um, when someone uh, enters the space, uh, let's see. The parrot tries to convince him to come over using various strategies of beckoning and flattery. Say, you look like someone who'd enjoy talking to a plastic bird. Or uh, like just sort of standard art world schmoozing, you know, like the verbal equivalent of the air kiss, you know. Darling. How marvelous to see you. I had no idea you were in town. Or just simple begging and pleading, you know, combined with a, like, just straight up Carney Bar Barker approach. Come in, come on in. Please, 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 please come in. Your fortune one dollar, your fortune one dollar. <clears throat> or just plain, like, idiotic. Hey, hey, what do you say? Why not visit a parrot today? Or just kind of under his breath, you know, like a kind of cautious uh, dealer. Smoke. Smoke. Yo, mister. Want some smoke? Come here. Anyway, if, if people got too close, you know, he told them to back off, and some visitors assumed that the parrot was also able to listen, uh, so they began to kind of talk to him pretty much like a, like a shrink. And um, in 1980, I wrote a, a song called Languages of Virus from Outer Space for William Burroughs. And the title was a quote from one of his books. And over the years, when I was asked about this song, my sort of standard remark was, well, it's a very strange thing for a writer to say that language is a disease communicable by mouth. But when I was writing this book, I realized that actually virus is not a disease. It's not even alive. It has no cell structure. And it's been called one of the organisms at the edge of life. But in some ways, that made language and virus even more alike. Because technically, a virus is an agent, like a secret agent. And language and virus share many basic traits, like mimicry and contagion, infection. And they work in similar ways, repetition, replication and deception, and they act like they're alive, but they're not. Now, in the digital world, of course, stories can go viral and malware can rip through your files like virulent disease and, and leave your information in shreds. And words can be mashed and infected, and your online identity can be hacked and grounded to spam. In short, William Burroughs and his extremely dystopian and spooky views about language and virus are turning out to be very, very real. Now, as an artist, I'm often using first person on my own experience, but I learned how to use second person from William Burroughs. Uh, and I first met him in 1978 at the Nova Convention, which was a three-day celebration of his work in New York. And during the days, there were these seminars about his work with Timothy Leary and Susan Sontag and many other writers and intellectuals. And at night, there were concerts by mu musicians and poets who'd been influenced by his work. So Frank Zappa read The Talking Asshole, Section Naked Lunch, and Patti Smith played the clarinet, and Phil Glass played the piano. And it was a wild mix of, of all the worlds of film and rock and literature and the avant-garde uh, that made up downtown New York. And Keith Richards was also supposed to be uh, appearing, but even though the promoters of this event uh, knew a week ahead of time that he wasn't going to show up, uh, they didn't announce it. They just scribbled a note and posted on the inside of the door to the theater, Keith Richards will not be appearing tonight in very, very light pencil. So hundreds of punk kids 
poured through the door looking for Keith, and Phil would be playing a solo piano piece, and they'd be yelling, Keith, Keith, and nothing would shut them up, and since I was one of the MCs, I'd have to keep going out on the stage to introduce someone else they didn't want to hear, you know, just keep the ball rolling, said the promoters, and finally, Burroughs uh, shuffled out, wearing a pork pie hat, and carrying a briefcase, which he just slammed down on the wooden desk, and he said, good evening, and that voice, it was like, gravel crunching under a 10-ton truck or like plastic ripping in slow motion. And he started talking about sex and drugs and alienation and things these kids thought that they'd invented themselves. And they couldn't believe it. They were like, Grandpa. <laughs> but it, it was that voice that really got to people. And you could never read his books again without re you know, hearing that voice just gnawing on every word. But the Nova Convention was the first time that I used electronic filters to alter my voice, and in this case, tuned to drop the pitch so that I sounded like a man, and the machismo surrounding Burroughs at the time was so thick. And this filter was just kind of my weapon and my defense. And it was the first time I used an audio mask, and being in drag was really, really thrilling. And this voice uh, eventually became a kind of alter ego. And now in 1981, I toured with uh, Burroughs and John Giorno, uh, when we did our collaborative double album called You're the Guy I Want to Share My Money With, was released, and I, I loved hanging out with them. I, I, I did have some problems, because Burroughs, you know, uh, really liked guns, and, and um, he'd go out into the parking lot uh, behind the theater for target practice. And, and second, he really didn't like women. Uh, but I, I really, I loved him, because he just really made me laugh. Um, now, the, uh, this was also, as I said, when I uh, learned to uh, say you, to talk to audiences directly, and Burroughs was a master of this. He knew how to talk to people, and it, this was not the you, the amorphous you in, uh, in I Love You love songs. Uh, you know, it was a very specific you, and it meant you who are sitting in the audience tonight, you the one wearing the green sweater, and I loved him because he saw and he described the dark side of America. And his, in his Thanksgiving prayer, he recites a litany of American acts of violence and war and ignorance and hatred. And at the very end, he intones in his most uh, condescending voice, you always were a headache and you always were a bore. Now, I invented this, um, this uh, digital filter. So uh, and lowered my voice and, and became what it, I called the voice of authority. And then it was uh, this male voice was also a way to create the other side of conversations and arguments in duets that were, that were essentially like um, solo shows. And after working with this filter for a while, I began to wonder what this guy looked like. So I made a video clone using a filter uh, called uh, the ADO, which widens the top of the frame, uh, creating the illusion of a big head and a very small body. So for example, the character I created had a mustache and a, a slick back hair and like size one shoes. And he looked like my demented like uncle. And so using a split screen, uh, I made several pieces with this character in the, in the mid-80s, and the first was called What You Mean We, uh, from 1985, and here's the um, first scene of that. So, you've been pretty busy for a multimedia performance artist. Let's see, I hear you make uh, records, films, books, and you've been on the road a lot, too, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I just got back from a, a concert tour, Japan and Europe, Australia. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And yeah, I'll be making a, another record soon. But lately I've been so busy doing press, mm -hmm. you know, interviews mm -hmm. and photo sessions mm -hmm. and talk shows like this one that uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have the time anymore to do the actual work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, you can't be in two places at once. Right. I mean, you, you wish there was another you. Yeah. So I, I, I talked to a, a design team about it, and mm -hmm. I mean, cloning is uh, in, still in very early stages, but I, I think we did a, 
a pretty, a pretty good job. And uh, we were dealing with uh, duplicating speech and a certain musical ability and uh, logic. Interesting. And a few things came out sort of strange, but then I think it's always strange to see some kind of reflection of yourself. And anyway, we do work together, and, and sometimes he's on his own. But I, I think it's working out really well, don't you? Uh, well, I, 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 write, I write the music, and uh, it's a uh, pretty interesting work, really. Uh, she does most of the words. Well, I mean, you've, you've been writing. Well, some. No, I mean, it's been really good. It really has been good. Well, uh, most of the time I'm not really, and I'm not really sure what I'm writing about, but uh, I, 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 keep, I, keep, <coughs> I keep busy, you know, I, 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 keep, I keep writing, writing. And I mean, eventually you're, you're going to be doing even more, even more things. Um, actually, I didn't realize the time. I, uh, look, I've got to uh, get to a, a photo session, so um, I've really got to go. Listen, you can do. you um, just uh, take over for me? Because, uh, great, uh, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Great. I'm really sorry. I made some other uh, things with um, this clone in various episodes, and we, and we were sometimes roommates, sometimes co-writers, and sometimes I was his shrink. Now, in the 90s, I continued uh, to use the male voice, always inventing new characters and tweaking the electronics, and this version of the voice is Fenway Bergamot, and the way he spoke began to just be a little bit more somehow melancholic and rambling, kind of like uh, long poems. Now, my husband, Lou Reed, really understood this character. And I have to say, not every husband would be so open to this kind of thing, but <laughs> Lou really loved inventing characters. And he decided this one had become so real that he needed a name. And so he decided to uh, call him Fenway Bergamot, which, um, which I have to say just sort of weirdly uh, suited him. Control is different for women than for men. Things go out of control for men and they have to fix it. They have to do something. But things go off the rails for women. And they have an option that men do not have. Because in a pinch, women can always start to cry. Yes, they've got that card to play. Things go out of control and out come the crying cards. It's, let's say, it is, it is acceptable. Now when men burst into tears, it's awkward. It's a rare thing. I have a small jar of men's tears collected during the last war. One of my truest treasures. The Dr. Women. As for their names, women are basically on a first name basis. 
The last name is just tacked on. It's hinged on. And it can be broken off so easily. Marriage, boom, divorce, boom, you're suddenly just plain Ruth. Or just plain Barbara. You just keep losing their last names along the way. No wonder they play the crying card. They're missing their last names. Meanwhile, their father's name is plastered all over their passport, their driver's license, all their official legal documents. It can actually, and the mother's last name, becomes a word so obscure. It can actually be used as a secret password. Name of first pet. Favorite color. Mother's maiden name. A code word that unlocks your most secret information. I'm thinking about uh, back to 1991 uh, when there was a, an event here at Town Hall uh, called the Blue Dots, and here we are. And I mean, um, our group was WAC, Women's Action Coalition. <laughs> yes, yeah, so WAC people that we uh, formed to support Anita Hill when she accused her boss, Clarence Thomas, the U.S. Supreme Court nominee of sexual harassment. Um, now, it was a complicated case. And Hill testified that when she worked for Thomas, he talked to her a lot about women having sex with animals and how much he loved films with group rape scenes. And Thomas himself called the investigation a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks. Just in case you think name-calling in the US was invented recently. No, there are other rape cases that were tried right after that one. And initially, when the accusers' faces were shown on TV, they put this very clumsy electronic blue dot in front of the women's faces to disguise their identity, to protect her, supposedly. Now, this idea, which started off as an extremely paternalistic one, didn't last long because it, it had the suggestion not of the protected person, but of the anonymous accuser. Flash forward more than a quarter of a century to Me Too, and you realize that even though it's sometimes painfully slow, sometimes actually there is progress. Now, speaking of... Um, changing things. I want to show you uh, an idea about uh, changing uh, the national anthem. And this is a um, PSA that, that I made. Here it is. You know, recently, a lot of people have been talking about changing the national anthem to America the Beautiful. Now, I don't know really if that's such a great idea. I mean, I really like the Star Spangled Banner. I mean, it is kind of hard to sing, though, with all those arpeggios, and you're out at the ballpark, and the fans are singing away, and it's sort of pathetic, really, watching everybody try to hang on to that melody. The words are great, though. Just a lot of questions written during a fire. Things like, hey, do you see anything over there? I don't know, there's a lot of smoke. Say. Isn't that a flag? Hmm, couldn't say, really. It's pretty early in the morning. Hey, do you smell something burning? I mean, that's the whole song. It is a big improvement, though, over most national anthems, which are in 4-4 time. You know, we're number one, this is the best place. I also like the B-side of the national anthem, Yankee Doodle. Truly a surrealist masterpiece. Yankee Doodle came to town, riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat, and called it macaroni. Now, if you can understand the words to this song, you can understand anything that's happening in the art world today.
So I um, made a lot of work about the political situation in the United States. And of course, there's always the larger question. I mean, how political should art be? How engaged should it be? Or how separate? And uh, there's many answers to this question as there are situations. And that's really sticky. And art is about physicality and sensation as well as ideas. And of course, sometimes, for example, like a giant blue painting can express freedom in a, in a more complete and effective and kind of delirious way than a long series of so-called well-intentioned political works that could end up being really, really didactic. Now in the 80s, I made an eight-hour work of songs and stories called the United States, which was in four parts, transportation, politics, money, and love. But war and violence were sub-themes of all of them. And I wrote the song, Oh Superman, in 1980 in response to the failure of the hostage rescue mission in Iran when uh, several helicopters uh, crashed and burned in the desert and what was meant as a demonstration of American technology and daring. And basically the song was about the fact that technology will not save you. And since then, I, I sang this song once every decade or so, and I, I did a show here at Town Hall in September 2001, just a, a few days after 9-11, and I sang Oh Superman, and while I was singing the words, here come the planes, they're American planes, made in America, smoking or non-smoking, I, I had this eerie sensation of singing about the absolute present. And usually, you know, songs are not about what happened like two days ago. And each time I revived the song, people would say, did you just write this? I, it's so much about what's going on right now. And they had forgotten that the real situation was that things hadn't actually changed at all. That the current war has been going on for well over 30 years and every once in a while getting a new name. The Gulf War, the Iraq War, uh, the War on Terror. Now in the 90s, I did a um, uh, series called Stories from the Nerve Bible, which was launched around the time of the first Gulf War, and I used imagery from the war, and the performance began with a quotation of this Italian futurist, Filippo Marinetti, war is the highest form of modern art. And the show ended with the, this ecstatic kind of media coverage uh, uh, of the bombing of Baghdad, uh, which journalists compared to a combination of Christmas and the 4th of July. Now, when we were doing tech rehearsals for the show in Tel Aviv, I got a message from the promoter, and he was really excited about lasers, and he wanted to see if I would like to use them uh, in the show. And uh, I said, lasers? I said, I mean, aren't they illegal uh, in theaters? And he said, not here in Israel. Uh, there are no rules about that. Would you like to see them? And I said, oh, no, no, yeah, not really. And, uh, and he said, because I just set them up in the parking lot outside, you know, with a lot of smoke bombs. And I walked outside, and there was a large truck with a startling bright blue line coming out of the side. And it was the kind of sharp line that looked like it was coming directly, you know, from the Star of Bethlehem and a painting of the birth of Jesus. And amazing, right, said the promoter, who had been a munitions expert in the Israeli army. And I, actually, it did look, look pretty sharp. And uh, here they are. Uh, and I ended up spending most of the night um, in the parking lot um, testing lasers and adding smoke to make tunnels of light. And I, I really loved them. And I decided to use them in several sections of the show. And sometimes we pointed lasers directly at the audience, completely illegal uh, in the US, <laughs> as if we were, you know, we were kind of performing a group eye surgery. You know, I have to say, I have um, many reservations about the part that I played in the art tech revolution. I love gear, and uh, I've almost always been a kind of a wirehead, and I, and I love new stuff. But of course now, it, it's kind of a nightmare. People have attached themselves to devices, and they have like a death grip on their phones, you know, constantly consulting them. And it's an addiction, and I think it's also about loss, you know. Things that are no longer three-dimensional are living in our phones, you know, record collections and photos and banking statements, contracts, emails, to-do lists that all have been so efficiently uh, crushed into numbers. Now, in the book, I wrote a, uh, about a show called Homeland, which was a collection of songs and stories about uh, war and the media and surveillance culture. 
And this was around the time of the Occupy movement. And it was, it was odd. One of the things that was happening was around then was that military language had begun to seep into everyday conversation. For example, you know, people were saying things like, copy that, you know, boots on the ground, above my pay grade, you know, Roger. And they were suddenly using this urgent, serious, clipped tone of voice, like they were issuing commands for drone bombings when they were actually just, you know, moving desks and various things around the office. And, but the language and the style of military efficiency was spreading everywhere, and the military and the, and the corporate were kind of merging. Also, violence became more central to the series of works I was doing about the US, and one of my guides in this effort to define what was happening was Ann Richards, the former governor of, of Texas, and she was such a realist, right? Yeah. Now, for example, when she was talking about how the NRA was com uh, campaigning to convince women to carry guns in their handbags for protection, she said, now, I don't know about you, uh, but I don't know a single woman in Texas who could find a gun in her handbag. <laughs> Ann Richards. Now, sometimes art and politics uh, find a synergetic way to combine, and I'm thinking of one night in 2011 after Zuccotti Park was cleared and our group, Occupy Art, was looking for things to do, and so we decided to stage an event at Lincoln Center, and Phil Glass's opera, Satyagraha, was at the Met that night. And this is the story, of course, of Gandhi, and the translation of the title is uh, Truth Force, and it's, of course, about civil disobedience. And so we arranged to have hundreds of Occupy Art activists show up, and it was a really beautiful, crisp December night, and Lincoln Center was sparkling, and after the opera, everybody streamed out all dressed up and still kind of jazzed by all the melodies and themes of justice and civil disobedience of Satyagraha ringing in their ears. And so they come out, and then the whole plaza is surrounded by police and the Occupy group chanting, and then there it was. So what does civil disobedience look like in your city tonight? And then Phil came out, and he read from the libretto, which was in Sanskrit, so fortunately he used an English translation. And the Occupy group used the mic check method to amplify his voice. So he says something which is repeated by people in ever-expanding circles. And he read these words that are thousands of years old, and the words were repeated by the crowd. When your government breaks, when your government breaks, when your government breaks, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Do you just sit there? Do you just sit there? Do you just sit there? Or do you act? Do you act? Do you act? I'm going to tell you another story. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, about a, um, let's see, Plan B. I need a Plan B. <laughs> and it has to do with a very long project about prisons. And this, it started out in um, 1997. I was invited to, by the Kunsthalle Krems, uh, a um, place in Austria, to come and do a sound installation in their church. And this was a 13th century um, church that had um, been used as a, also as a um, pilgrim flop house, and then it uh, became a uh, kind of cultural center, it had that kind of arc. And so I came to, to this um, uh, church and I tried to figure out how to do a sound installation, but everything was so reverberant, everything was just bouncing back and forth and it just really didn't make any sense. And so the curators kept saying, okay, so what's the show? And, and um, I, I, I just, I didn't have any ideas. So one day just to kind of escape the curators, I walked up to this bell tower and got to the top of the bell tower. and. Um, in the, uh, and I looked across this perfect little Austrian town uh, to, uh, in the middle of this place was a, a maximum security prison. And on the other side uh, of, of that was a, a guard in a guard tower with a machine gun pointing at me. So I'm the bell tower, he's in the guard tower. I was like, Whoa. okay, so I ran down the stairs and I said to the curators, what we're gonna do is um, something about telepresence and we're gonna build a, a video studio in the, um, in the prison, we're gonna have one of the prisoners uh, sit there very, very still, and then we're gonna make a life-size statue of him and put it in the opposite of the church, and then we're gonna beam his image live onto uh, the statue in the church. So it'll be about you know, um, the attitude towards the 
church and the prison to the body, you know, incarnation, incar incarceration, there, not there, that kind of thing. And surprisingly, the, the curator said, um, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, I was pretty su uh, surprised that they, they agreed at this point, but he began to have second thoughts. You know, is this really a really good idea to do something like this in a, in a very, very conservative um, country like Austria? And a few days later, the, the curator said that they discovered that there, um, that the, there was an Austrian law that um, said that um, prisoners no longer owned their own image, which is, of course, a 21st century problem, too, who owns your image. And so they were not able to do it. Uh, and act, actually, at that point, I was kind of relieved because I thought, you know, uh, maybe this isn't um, the best idea to do in a very, very conservative place like Austria, and so I was a little bit relieved. And then a couple days after that, they said the, their attorney general had heard about the project and loved it, and it was back on. So I was like, you know, was like um, <laughs> finally, things went back and forth like that, and finally uh, we didn't do it. But a few weeks later, the Whitney Museum asked please do a project. And I um, proposed another version of this thing called Life, uh, which would be done in collaboration with Sing Sing. Uh, so in this case, it would be about two guarded institutions. What do you keep in there with the prison and the museum? And how, how are things guarded and why? So we had several meetings with the Sing Sing wardens and we met a lot of the prisoners who were um, doing a lot of meditation techniques and they'd been dragged in under the Rockefeller drug law that was going on in the late 90s. And they were interested in trying to sit for even longer periods of time. Now, the plan was to beam the prisoner's image from the prison to the museum using these high-speed um, uh, T1 lines. But this time, the proposal uh, was canned because of sort of um, technical shortcomings, but also I suspected um, it had something to do with the rapidly increasing prison populations because prisons were becoming uh, privatized and they were very big becoming a big business and many institutions were not that anxious to highlight this. Now shortly after this version was uh, abandoned, I was describing it to Germano Chalant, who's a very kind of can-do curator, and about an hour after our meeting, he faxed me, have located prison and cultural institution. So we finally did this project in Milan as a, as a kind of collaboration between the Prada Foundation and San Vittore Prison. Now the budget, for the installation was the biggest I had ever worked with. Uh, to make the video connection, we had to pull up huge parts of the streets to lay cable and build studios and make relay stations. And when I looked at the budget, I always had a lot of questions. I, 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 I say, what, what is this item here for a concrete consultation, I would say. And, and we didn't use any concrete in this project. And they would say, oh, that was for the uh, engineer's cousin, Giorgio, who stopped by to look at the width of the doorways. <laughs> I, I quickly got the gist of this, you know, so, you know, family business, no questions asked. But the most difficult part of this work, of course, was the potential for exploitation. A prisoner sits um, motionless in uh, the, um, for months, and I just signed my name to it as a kind of artwork. And I, so I spent a lot of time in the prison talking to inmates and looking for a uh, willing uh, collaborator. So uh, the prisoners were mostly white collar criminals, extremely smart and sophisticated men, responsible in uh, various ways for dismantling the Italian economy. And <laughs> they knew um, Greek and Latin, and they were very charming, like really old world, courteous, you know, like and they were over the top, and they were kind of allowed to cook in these very well-equipped prison kitchens, and they had big knives and wine collections, and they were very busy writing books and articles and <laughs> would receive visitors, and they were all wearing Armani, and you know, sometimes it was chilly, those very stylish Milanese quilted vests, and the only thing that was really off about their off outfits was, was their shoes, because, you know, uh, they were wearing uh, slippers, you know, because they were going nowhere ever. <laughs> so the meetings went on, and because they were lawyers, and because they were extremely skillful at manipulating people using body language and subtle vocal sounds, they gradually shifted my attention to a man sitting in the corner. And um, I was, finally I was talking only to him. And it was clear that who was in charge and that they had decided who the collaborator was, was going to be and they were just kind of humoring me. But anyway, 
Santino was his name, and he was a bank robber and murderer, having inadvertently shot some people on his way out of the bank. Um, and he was serving a life sentence. He was a writer. And we began to discuss the project. And I said, Santino, if we collaborate on this project, uh, what do you think about it? And he said, I see it as a virtual escape. And I said, you're my man. <laughs> and Santino uh, trained himself uh, to sit motionless. He sat in the gallery for many weeks. And a, a camera in the gallery allowed him to adjust the projection of himself onto this cast of, of his body uh, that he wasn't able to see anything else uh, in the gallery. And at the opening, um, when I finally saw the statue with this living image of Santino projected onto it, I was really shocked. Um, he didn't look like a prisoner. He looked like a judge or a king or, or like your very, very distant father, you know, who doesn't, doesn't see you, not there, you know, so distant and, and remote and, and kind of regal. Now, I had always wanted to do this telepresence project in the United States, and the privatization of prisons was one of the causes for the uh, massive increase in prison population, of course, and the United States currently has the, the largest prison population in the world. So when I was invited by the Park Avenue Armory in, to do an installation, I proposed a few things like um, streaming a... Uh, a uh, 12 prisoners who were, well, first of all, trying to, to make one gigantic one because, of course, the armory is, is so huge, and then maybe taking uh, streaming um, images from 12 prisons, and you'd have these um, prisoners who were serving in upstate New York, and it would wrap onto these double life-size casts of their bodies, and it would sort of look like some hot chef suit sort of uh, lineup of things. And our, um, our small team, spent months meeting people and talking to wardens and many of the organizations that work with prisoners, teaching meditation and mindfulness. And, and at the end, you know, uh, Homeland Security contacted me and said, you know, this will never happen in the United States of America. I, that did not seem to have an upside. So uh, the director, the artistic director of the Armory said, okay, what's plan B? Now, I didn't have a plan B, you know, and so I quickly came up with this idea of, um, like a big uh, landscape. Uh, let's see, where is that? Um, uh, no, it's kind of a landscape that would um, have a, a lot of um, weather in it, and it would um, also have uh, miniature ponies and kids standing around, and uh, these kids would be wearing like little beards, you know, uh, as really little cowboys, and lots of weather in a deserted cottage, and various parades of various things from American history uh, and uh, this and that, uh, um, lots of miniature ponies. And <laughs> now because the armory needed to do advanced press, we did a photo session uh, with these uh, ponies that we herded into this dark mahogany <laughs> board of directors room. And eventually they were on these banners outside of the armory. Um, and uh, my sister, who trains ponies said, you know, if ponies were people, they would all be in jail. Uh, she's a horse trainer. She knows what she's talking about. And she said that they're mean and they're smart. Uh, they're like, um, they're like psychopaths. <laughs> then through a series of, of kind of unlikely circumstances and good luck, I got in touch with Reprieve, a London-based legal team that represents prisoners facing capital punishment in the United States as well as detainees from Guantanamo. And I remember this first call that I made to Reprieve, and it was um, really awkward. So, you know, like, what we want to do, we, we want to um, beam the, the image onto someone in, um, uh, from here to there, and uh, they're not allowed to come into the country, so it would be like, and, and I, I was kind of babbling, trying to describe this, per the, this project to this person. And, and it, then instead of, of uh, uh, this person saying, thank you so much for telling me about your very interesting project, uh, the voice on the other end of the phone said, tell me more. And so this was the head lawyer of Reprieve, and after a couple more phone calls, she said she had a client who might be interested in working with me, and his name was Mohammed al Garani, and he had been the youngest detainee in Guantanamo. And he had been there from the ages of 14 to 21, basically tortured, uh, 
uh, thrown in solitary, his teeth pulled out, he was cut all over. Uh, he lived with his family uh, in Saudi Arabia and he went when he was 13 to 12 to Pakistan to study with his, in his uncle's computer school. And he was kind of found in a, in a raid of a mosque and sold for $5,000 uh, to uh, the US and taken to um, Guantanamo. The, I guess one of the things that I learned in, in working on this project uh, was that uh, the people who are still there in Guantanamo and the people who've been dragged in there are not actually, they're not actually the bad guys. They were not, the, they were, uh, so many of them were, the majority far, uh, were dr taxi drivers, students, photographers, journalists, goat herders, and who had been purchased uh, by us uh, when we needed Saudi prisoners for $5,000. Um, now, I was the first American that um, uh, Mohammed El Gorani had met who wasn't his interrogator or torturer uh, or guard. And so gradually, we became friends. And uh, I have many times tried to imagine the process of interrogation. I mean, what does your own story sound like to you after so many repetitions and denials and revisions and hundreds of questions? And anyway. Um, he, uh, Mohammed was um, a, a great um, storyteller himself. So I went to Africa where he lives now and uh, met him and realized that the project was going to be very different because he was really so articulate and so such a great sort of um, narrator. And he would had a million stories and he described one day when he was, uh, one of his fellow detainees told his interrogator that he had a dream that a submarine came to Guantanamo to rescue everyone who was there. And that night, Guantanamo Bay was filled with helicopters and ships with enormous searchlights looking for the dream submarine. <laughs> but you know, one of the reasons that um, this project could work was because of language, because uh, when we, uh, the first thing we did when we got these prisoners was to declare them non-persons. So they were not, a, 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 um, the Geneva Convention was, was not, um, did not apply to them. And also, even though American doctors were at every torture session, we were not allowed to say that. We, the only thing we could say was um, the behavior, American behavioral science consultancy teams were at every um, session. Also, there were no, uh, there were a lot of suicides at Guantanamo until it, they were relabeled something else. They were called um, manipulative self-injurious behavior. There was a lot of that, but no suicides. Anyway, um, habeas corpus, as it, as it was called, uh, the name of this piece was a work about language, but it was also a work about cameras. And sometimes I really wish that Susan Sontag was still around to write about what had actually happened when the camera and the gun were combined and how that changed uh, what we can see and what we can destroy and how that changed surveillance and violence in our country. Actually, more than that, I really hope that there's like a, a young Susan Sontag, someone with another name, who can take on this topic of violence in this country and our total blindness to it. Anyway, um, so the, um, we built this uh, studio in Africa and, uh, and Mohammed learned to sit very still for long periods of time. And then we um, bounced his uh, image into the, the drill hall. And uh, this was a, um, onto a, basically this was the size of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, his image was there and, and th with, mirror balls are so great. Mirror balls are just <laughs> magic. And um, so there were, there was a lot of information also about his case, and uh, so people got to, to read about it, and there was, um, they came into this place, and, uh, and they were encouraged to roam around, or, yeah. So like in Milan, though, we had installed a camera very high in the ceiling, aimed at the statue, and this camera allowed Mohammed, who was in Africa, to see into the armory from Africa, so he could adjust his image and align the projection of his body onto the statue. So we were in constant touch with the African studio saying, you know, okay, uh, tell Mohammed to move his left hand a little 
bit to the right. And we would wait during the 30 second delay and then watch as this huge arm of the statue made the adjustment. Uh, because three inches was basically like, you know, three feet. Now, people in public spaces have become so aware of surveillance cameras in the last few years that they have a kind of sixth sense about where they're located. So it didn't take long for people to realize that if, if they got very close to the statue and it was behind them and they faced the camera, that Mohammed could see them in Africa. And so they began to stand in line. When they got into position, they looked up into the rafters and the camera and they just began to wave and they did dances and they, they held signs. And most of all, they mouthed the words, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it was one of the most intense moments of, of my life um, as an artist to watch uh, this connection being made between uh, these two worlds. Now, oh, we're, uh, I want to say that we have a really special guest this evening, someone that I have admired for a very long time. And so I'm really happy that she's here uh, to speak to you about a few things. And please welcome Chelsea Manning. Hello. Oh. Hello? Okay, yeah, that is my voice. You never know when you're on the stage. <laughs> um, so, the last, yeah, I, I, I always feel amazing being on the stage with somebody that who's a, who I've always viewed as a legend. This is my second time since I, I, that I had a chance to be on the stage with, uh, with Lori Anderson. And, uh, the, you know, this, like, I, she invited me to come speak at one of her events, and so I went and, and I went ahead and did that, and she asked me to talk about prisons, and uh, that's what I'm here to do for just a second. So um, I, I just got out of prison less than a year ago, and uh, I'm still kind of in shock. I'm still kind of surprised that I am actually out here. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've kind of been putting myself out there, and I've been doing things, but... Most, but I, you know, I've had to relearn how to live life, and it's a very different world than the life that I was living in before, and I was experiencing before. But it's also been that there's been this like trend, this connection between the time before and the time now, and so there's this familiarity with all these different things, and I'm like create, recreating moments of familiarity as well, which has been. Uh, interesting because, you know, and, you know, this is a, a night for stories, and so my story has sort of been a, a coming-of-age story for me. I mean, you know, there's all these, dra there's all this drama that people look at uh, and, and hear in a story that, in a story like mine, but for me personally, this, I'm just growing up, and I'm just getting started with my life, and I'm learning so much about what it's like to be a person again, because I've spent most of my adult life in prison. I spent seven years in a military prison, uh, and five different prisons at that, uh, and, and I spent a year of that in solitary confinement, and that I'm only now starting to realize just how much that has impacted me in my daily life, and how much that has changed me. I mean, I was just in the car coming up here from Maryland today, and uh, and I just broke down crying, and I didn't even know why, you know. And I and I, you know, my friend that was driving me told me, you know, it's just uh, shocking how together you are, you know, everywhere else that you go. And I think she's right because I'm, you know, still trying to figure all of this out. And I think that it's important to remember that there are people in prison and that there are people living their lives and trying to figure out who they are in an environment where you can't. You have no identity. You have no reality. I, you know, I didn't even have any photos of me apart from mug shots for seven years. And, and you know, I've I come out into the world and I'm sort of a public figure, but 
I'm still this 20 year, in, in, you know, I'm 30 years old now, but I feel like I'm still 20 years old and I'm just getting started with living my life again. And I, my apartment is an interesting place. A friend of mine pointed out to me about two weeks ago that it looks like a cell how I've furnished it, because it's kind of empty. It's a little barren. I have books, they're all neat and tidy. And, and she's right. You know, I've found familiarity in that. You know, because I was able to find familiarity in a place that I lived in for seven years. You know, and I remember that I could find beauty in there. You know, I, I found that I had, I had a double, you know, I had a two slit window at one point, and uh, for, for, I could watch the seasons change and I could look out in the distance, you know, even in all the pain and all the distress and all the like feeling of hopelessness and loss, I would look sometimes just find beauty in looking out through the window, uh, you know, beyond the barbed wire, of course, but, you know, at the hills of Kansas and see the green or the brown or the blue in the distance and watch it change and watch the birds and trees and find that we actually have beauty and it's right in front of us all the time. We just, we're too busy sometimes out here to remember that. And I think that for artists like, you know, like, like Lori, she appreciates that. And as an electronic musician, I've always, uh, I've always admired her work, and I've always found solace in electronic music. And um, and going back to you know going back to prison, I think you know my, I'm mostly here just to say I have I want to see them. I want to see more prisons being closed down, and I want to see more prisons you know like more of the world becoming better because I I'm worried about where things are going. And I'm still, like, I'm lost along with all of you, except I've been thrown into this mess in the last, you know, all of a sudden I'm, like, learning, like, re relearning this new world that we live in. And, um, yeah, and I think we, we can depend on each other for that. And um, I... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so... That's all I have, so thank you. Lori? Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, there are um, many st other stories about uh, codes in this book, and particularly in uh, dreams, there's a, a huge diary of, of dreams in this uh, code that I made, and uh, also there are other stories about the way that we try to crack our own codes because so many of these things are just uh, inaccessible, starting with our own dreams and other things that are in our, in our minds that we just can't find. But I want to tell you a story about a um, uh, strange committee that I was on. And I've always loved working on um, projects with big themes. 
And in 2002, I was a part of a committee of artists who created the opening ceremony for the Olympics in Athens. And I think they asked me because they had this idea that I'm a multimedia artist and they were planning an elaborate tripped out high tech ceremony. And the thing they didn't know was that I, um, at the time I was a burned out multimedia artist. <laughs> And I'd done too many projects that were just based on button pushing, and I was tired of putting technology through its paces, and lots of the other, you know, of the large multimedia and theater pieces around this time were just like, they looked like a lot of trade shows. You know, hey, look, touch this button, something big happens, bingo, you know, anyway. The people on the committee were the smartest people I'd ever met. And I was the only non-Greek, and we had meetings for almost two years, and sitting around a table, and clouds of smoke, lots of coffee. And what is it about the Greek language, I was asking myself. They were always asking questions that were so complex, and um, questions that would never even have occurred to me. And when they asked them, they would all like look up at the ceiling, you know, as if the questions in there, many complicated answers were uh, hanging up there, sort of like chandeliers. And <laughs> as the meetings went on, we all, we had to become a little bit more crap practical because we did have to come up with something that would really happen, you know, like an actual ceremony. So it took them a while to realize that I was a lapsed multimedia artist and not completely on board. So every plan they came up with was just, you know, let's have a giant statue lower down and then explode into a million, like, LED stars. And I would say, nah, I, I, I've seen something you know, like almost exactly like that. I mean, I didn't say where I'd seen this before because it was possibly only in my own imagination. <laughs> and, and then they'd say, how about if eight full-size ships sail across the stadium and then sink to the bottom of the sea? And I'd say, I don't know, you know, big, big ships, they're just kinda, kind of obvious. And finally, they began to get irritated. And, well, what do, you, what do you like? And I said, well, you know, not everybody knows. Uh, if you push a button, you know, complicated things happen, but you invented everything here in Greece. You came up with the hardest thing of all, the thing that no one can do. And suddenly, they were like my class. So they were their dark, blinking eyes, you know, turned towards me expectantly, and I paused for a while, and they s and then said, you know, you invented know thyself. I mean, you invented that concept and, and know thyself as dangerous and difficult and radical and almost no one can do it. And they looked unconvinced and I, I, I suddenly thought, maybe all of them really did know themselves already. <laughs> but I carried on anyway, you know, you know, you could write know thyself really big, you know, on the stadium field. I was trying to make it sound impressive, you know, and innovative, you know, maybe write it like, you know, in fire. They didn't seem at all interested and I, and I began to say less and less in the meetings. But as I said, I was the only non-Greek on the committee, so they had hired a tutor to get me up to speed on Greek history since the Olympic ceremony was meant to refer to some of their key moments. So my tutor was the chief archeologist of the Parthenon and his job for the past 20 years had been researching and restoring the original building and replacing the pieces that are still strewn all over the Acropolis. Now the building was already almost um, 2,000 years old and when a bomb exploded in the um, 17th century, uh, fragmenting much of the structure. Now, it was taking a very, very long time to reassemble. And would it be finished? Uh, my guess was never. But we spent days walking around the site, picking up tiny fragments of marble and stone with tweezers and looking at them with magnifying glasses and talking about history. And I finally decided to ask my tutor a question, something he, that had been bothering me since we started our sessions. And I was afraid it would sound really idiotic, uh, if not just naive, but I had the confidence to ask my tutor, since he looked exactly like Plato, or uh, you know, at least the way Plato was depicted in the busts, you know, bearing his name. So I finally asked the question, and it sounded kind of rehearsed and weird, but I, you know, I still wanted to know the answer if there was one, and I said, okay, so the Greeks invented so many things in such an amazingly short time. Philosophy, geometry, architecture, sculpture, history, epic poetry, physics, ethics. I mean, basically every subject, discipline, and art form that Western civilization is built on. So, what happened? <laughs> Why aren't we a thousand times smarter now? Why didn't we just keep building on this? Now, my tutor didn't hesitate, and, and, and he said, okay. I'll tell you why. 
uh, at least I'll tell you my theory, and he continued, in ancient times, people came to the Parthenon to worship Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom. And they brought their offerings, stylized, iconic statues, young male athletes in mid-stride, and, and, and they placed them around the temple like votive figures, and gradually the sculptors got more skillful and ambitious and competitive, and they began to make statues that were more complex. The statues began to seem more lifelike. They began to have attitudes, sort of personalities swing, you know. Soon the Acropolis, you know, was crowded with works of art, and it began to look like, kind of like an uncurated biennial. <laughs> and I will never forget what um, he said next. And he said, and then the people who came to worship there said, we can't pray in an art museum. And so they left the Parthenon and they went back to the groves and the streams and the mountain caves where the gods had come from and they worshiped there. But we can't pray in an art museum has haunted me ever since. And at first I thought, how depressing. Just when the greatest rational era in human history was beginning, the need to believe in something became stronger than the need to experiment, to know, and to think. And then I thought, wait a second. Just think how many people in the world today, in the United States, for example, would much rather believe something that goes through the messy process of thinking for themselves. And we took this idea of identity, trying to know ourselves, and it was our heritage, but we really got carried away with it, you know, the, the me part of it. And we never really figured out how to have a conversation, and now we're in like a, a stalemate, like everywhere. Both sides in Congress barricaded, screaming at each other, and even in our everyday lives, you know, we'd rather text an argument than have one in person, which takes skills, you know, we don't have that many of anymore. Now, just as an aside, though, um, I was talking with a journalist recently, and and I made the mistake of asking her over to my studio, which I never do because there's never enough time to hide all the things you need to hide when you really need to hide them. <laughs> and she took out her tape recorder and then she took out an old sock and then she put it on her hand and she said, do you mind if I use this sock for the interview? <laughs> and I stared at the sock for quite a while, you know, maybe, maybe a little too long. And then she said, well, what do you think? Shall we begin? Now, she was a pretty bad puppeteer, and the, the sink was way off, you know, and I, I wasn't really sure I could talk to a sock, so I said, wait here, I'll be right back, and then I got my own sock, because, you know, there was always single <laughs> socks laying around. We sat around talking about music with our sock puppets. But um, back to conversation, the dynamics of back and forth. Uh, we've lost a lot of that in the effort to create your own credible identity and stick to it no matter what. You know, news is what you want to hear, and we're talking kind of to ourselves, and whoever isn't on our side is the enemy, which is identity politics has done and come to our country. But I've used this duet in conversation in a lot of my work because they have this dynamic which is missing in uh, monologues. And I'm thinking of Plato, and he is sitting around, and he's really missing Socrates. And he's thinking of something, freedom or a geometric proof or ghosts or shadows or whatever. And he's all alone and he says to himself, I wonder what Socrates would say about this. And then just to hear his teacher's voice again or to bring him back, you know, he invented the dialogues, a radical new two-sided form of philosophy. And he named the method the Socratic method after his teacher. And some say that Plato wasn't so much the friend of, of Socrates as the playwright who invented him. And I just want to say that um, one of the biggest losses in my life is the loss of conversations that I had with my husband, Lou. And this nonstop conversation lasted for 21 years. And this book that I ha made is not about that, but half the stories were from then. But when you have a life that gets so entangled with your partner, and then it ends, you look for ways to express that energy. And Lou is a Tai Chi master, and he really understood where energy, where Chi, comes from. It's, it, and it's not just these smooth moves that you see old people doing in the park, because this one, for example, this one goes like that, that looks so graceful, decapitation. <laughs> but all the um, moves have the... The balance of yin and yang, a conversation, dialogue, and I'll show you just a few. They have really beautiful titles. 
But while I do this, and it's going to be short, keep in mind that Tai Chi is a martial art, and every move you do is um, an invisible, uh, is with an Im invisible imaginary partner or opponent. So it's like dancing or fighting with a ghost. And here's the music of this silent language, and I'll show you a couple of the moves. <laughs> We're about to wrap it up, but I want to tell you a story about um, the wall. And that's the wall between us and Mexico. Now, the wall is a story because it's not a wall yet. And yet it seems as solid as a wall. And who knows if it's real? It keeps appearing and disappearing from the national budget. But it is a difficult wall to build because two huge rivers the Rio Grande and the Colorado run through the border at many places, making gigantic holes in the new wall. Anyway, lately, I've been reading about uh, the play The Birds by Aristophanes, because it's also a comedy about building a big wall. Now, for those of you who have not read the play lately, here's a rough summary. The story starts out with two poets and they're trudging along a dusty road, and they're leaving Athens and talking with each other, complaining about the poetry scene. And they're saying, people in the poetry scene are so fake. It's all so academic. You know, it's not like the old days, you know, 2,500 years ago. They're all so shallow now, like no real pizzazz. And they're walking along, they're dissing everyone like that, and they walk further and further into the countryside. And some birds start circling around them and dive bombing them once in a while and the poets are sort of swatting them away and then suddenly one of the poets gets an idea and he says, wait a second, I have a really good idea for you birds. So he calls all the birds together for a meeting and they start arriving from all over the world. It's like a giant meeting. Big flocks of doves and some sparrows and a bunch of parrots and hawks and robins and starlings arrive in their complicated swarming patterns and a few penguins make it up from the south and so on. And he says to the birds, listen, listen birds. And he, he's kind of breathless the way you are when you think you have something very insightful to say. And he says, I have this great idea and it's an economic opportunity for all of you. And he's starting to shout now because the birds are all squawking and cheeping and he can't really get their attention because they can't focus because, you know, because they're birds. <laughs> so he tries again, may I have your attention? Listen, listen up, you birds. Just settle down for a second. And I have this great idea. It's an economic opportunity for all of you. And here it is. And finally, after a while, it, it gets a little quieter, but the audience is still distracted. And the birds are all looking around nervously, checking things out, their neighbor's size, their feet, their different wingspans. And the poet continues, OK, OK, let me ask you a simple question. When the gods come down to Earth, for whatever reason, for example, to have an affair with one of the human girls or human boys, they come down through the air, down through where? 
the birds are looking really blank. They come down through your area, your territory. And the birds are now looking around at all their neighbors, kind of unsure where this argument is going. And the poet continues, and another question. When they come down through your territory, do you charge them anything? In other words, do you ask them for money? No, you do not. So, okay, okay, let me ask you another question. When humans make their sacrifices to the gods and smoke rises up through the air, it's again coming through where? The birds are hesitating now. Oh, this is, this is kind of a lot of questions. And the poet answers his own questions. The smoke comes through your territory. And again, may I ask, do you charge anything for it? The answer is no. You are missing an economic opportunity. So here's what you need to do. You need to build a wall between heaven and earth. And you need to charge money for going from one place to the other. And you need to set up a station where you can charge the money like, like a lot of money. And the birds are looking at each other now. And there's a lot of unrest now in the crowd. And they're flapping their wings and rustling their feathers. And one of them finally says, yes, but building a wall is work. And, uh, and, and he pauses, uh, getting his thoughts together. And he says, and you know, we're birds. And so we don't work. You're familiar with that expression, you know, free as birds, right? You know, and, uh, anyway. The play has a surprise ending, but I, I, I won't give it away for those of you who haven't read it or who have read it, but just don't happen to remember it at the moment. And now, of, of course, you have to re read it to see what happens when they finally build a wall between the earth and the sky. Uh, we're going to wrap it up, but I just want to say a couple of, show you one or two things about virtual reality, because I've been doing a lot of that for the last couple of years. And when my collaborator first asked me to do that, I said, absolutely not. I hate the way it looks. It's bright, flat, ugly. People look like they're made of rubber. It's gaming. It's basically nine-year-old boys. Nothing against nine-year-old boys. But then I said, you know, if I can make something hand-drawn that's about words, and if you can, if you can fly, and... Um, Almost everything I've made as an artist is, is about the same thing. It's about disembodiment. It's about trying to, it's about disappearing. It's about just not being there. It's like if somebody takes your picture and you look like, you know, this, and you kind of say, no, that's not me. You actually can't take a picture of me. I'm the one on the inside looking out this way. And that's what uh, VR is. So there's some, a couple of um, pictures of that here. And uh, these are... Uh, oops, these are inside this VR called Chakram, which is a big place where you can uh, fly around and read stories, hear them, um, uh, fall over, um, find things. And this is how it uh, looked when it was in, in at Mass Mocha now where it's installed. And this is... Um, uh, another view of that, so that you put the mask on and then you go into this world. And now I'm going to just show you just a very short clip, a two-dimensional version of this. Um, uh, and here we go with the short version of Chakram. I dreamed I was a dog in a 
talk show. And my father came to the talk show and he said, that's a really good dog. I like that dog. So we're just uh, running out of time a bit. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, that's Chaco. Uh, and um, one of the ones that we didn't finish was called heart surgery. And um, the way that works is you put the thing on and, and you're in this world and you're, you're on a gurney, you're like, your re view is restricted, you're shooting down a hallway, then doors sp spring open, and you're, you're shoved into this place, and then into a big room, and over, over in the corner, people are like sharpening some knives and talking about the heart surgery. And you realize, it's my heart surgery. And then these uh, kind of lights come down over time, and then some surgeons with masks, and then, then this comes towards you, and your vision starts getting blurry, and then, and then uh, they make a cut, and then out comes your heart, and they rest it on your chest for a while. And then um, the head surgeon just gets a call, and he said, no, I got to go. And he and his whole team leave. They just leave. And you're there. And I'm looking around about a, a minute. The, you hear the door open, and footsteps. I come in and I start lean down and start telling you a really long complicated story. <laughs> and you're like not the right time for a story. <laughs> it's like doo -doo. you know anyway you can use a lot of things. You can rip people's hearts out. It's really just uh, the greatest fun. Um, <laughs> now, as I wrote this book about loss I had to keep asking what does it really mean to lose things? And I wrote a song once about uh, living right next to a train track. And on the shelf, you have a great collection of glass and your whole collection of glass and porcelain things. And every time the train comes by, it rattles the shelf and things fall and they break. And each time that happens, you replace these things. And you replace them with cheaper and cheaper things until they finally, all you have is a bunch of just really cheap, unbreakable plastic junk. And it was, I think, a song about the various ways that you can think about hope. So. Sometimes when you lose things, you know, you try to replace them with similar or better things. And sometimes when you lose things, like a friend, like when a friend dies, you make it, you sometimes you just make it less important somehow. You, you know, you say, I, you know, I didn't really know him that well after all, you know, or he was sort of a pain. And of course, this is the way to make your loss more bearable through words. Sometimes you don't know what you lost. You just feel like you lost something. You frisk your, you're frisking yourself, keys, phones. You just have this weird feeling. And sometimes you lose things before you know it. Your looks, your reputation, your Facebook friends. And on a wider level, sometimes you can lose civility and fairness and democracy. And sometimes it's, it's good to lose things like stage fright and baby fat. And so it's not always bad, but I wrote this book about art. Uh, but I'm really not sure what art should be. But I am pretty sure, after being a student for a very long time, of, I'm sure of two things. And first, is that there are actually some ways to be happy about being unhappy. And second, that we are not here to have a bad time and to suffer, but the actual reason that we're here is to have a really, really, really good time. Now, I have a meditation teacher who says that everything that happens, no matter what, is about love. Everything in life is about love. That's all there is. That's the extent of it. And that even suicide is love because it's an attempt to be free. 
And one last thing, the last page of the book is a dedication to Lou. And as I wrote this book about what I lost and what I found, I have often thought about Lou's phrase, between thought and expression. And this is such an amazing phrase, between thought and expression. I mean, what happens between the time you think about something and the moment you express it? I mean, countless things. And I try not to forget that these words come from a song and that the next line at th in that song is, lies a lifetime. And so it's between thought and expression, lies a, li lies a lifetime. And the song this is from is about Margarita and Tom and how they tried to find out what love is. And it goes like this. Some kind of love, Margarita told Tom, between thought and expression lies a lifetime. Situations arise because of the weather, and no kinds of love are better than others. Some kind of love, Margarita told Tom, like a dirty French novel, combines the absurd with the vulgar. And some kinds of love, the possibilities are endless. And for me to miss one would seem to be groundless. Thanks. Good night.